Uh, last time I talked to the freshman retreat was actually in 2006 when I was a senior. Um, I was one of the senior captains. I was actually the first senior captain that Mr. Gualtieri has ever had, myself along with Austin Ryan, who you might see around. He wears a suit. He probably will ask you for money eventually. Um, but, uh, but that retreat was a little bit different. Um, we were sitting in the set. My last speech, I have to admit I was a little bit mad. Uh, one of my freshmen in my small group had spilled an entire two-liter thing of Coke all over my sleeping bag uh, that night, so I wasn't really the most happy of campers. But so, uh, I'll preface it with this, is that I'm, I'm much happier now than I was back then. Um, but hopefully you enjoyed the movie. I think one of the cool things about this movie is that I think it applies a lot to Fairfield Prep. And as I was thinking about what I should talk about, I went back and I looked at my high school yearbook from when I was a senior. And the theme throughout my high school yearbook, surprisingly enough, was building bricks. All right, so very similar. Nine years ago, we had the same idea of how to build community that you guys are having today. And as I'm thinking about this, and as I'm watching this movie, I'm thinking to myself, here's a football team that wins 151 straight games, right? They win over and over and over and over and over again. And yet, when they lose, they immediately become underdogs. Right? And there's this whole story of how do you come back and how do you redeem yourself um, in times of adversity. And at first, this team struggles, right? They're sitting around and you got guys who are being selfish and you got guys who are worried about records and you got guys who are worried about their own playing time. And it comes down to a couple of individuals and a, and a full coaching staff and a, and a kind of a team mentality in order to kind of re, re, reinvent themselves, I should say, and kind of figure out how to get back on top. You know, and so I was thinking about different things that have helped me kind of get back on top and kind of my own prep experience. Now, my prep experience was different than all of yours. Um, it's always going to be different, and that's what makes prep unique. But one of the best lessons I learned when I was at prep is that in life, there are three things you can never get back, all right? And that is time, opportunity, and the spoken word, all right? I'm gonna start with time, all right? Time is something that can be measured. Time is something that, you know, we don't have an infinite amount of it, all right? God puts us on this earth and we're trying to figure out how long we have. And so you don't know when it's all gonna end. So when you have an opportunity to, uh, to go to a school like PrEP and to walk around the halls of Berkman's and Xavier and Arupe, you need to take advantage of it. You know, I did the math out, even though I, I, even though I teach history. Um, and it's, you basically hear for about 720 days, and you'll go to 5,460 periods. Now, that sounds like a lot, but I can still remember the first day of my PrEP experience, and I can still remember the last day of my PrEP experience, walking around in that really nice white coat, you know, shaking hands and getting ready to go off to Providence College, right? When you think about time, you think about a retreat like this. You think about a, an opportunity to meet classmates that you might have never gotten, to, gotten a chance to talk to. You think about people who, you know, maybe uh, if I hadn't come to prep, if I had gone to my public school, I never would have met, all right? You know, Austin Ryan, you know, is sitting in the front row. He's from Monroe, and I'm from Fairfield. If I had gone to Ludlow, I never would have met him. If he had gone to Massac, he never would have met me. And, you know, 12 years later, we're best friends. Right? There's something to be said about that. All right? Now, the crazy thing about time is that when you're young, you don't think it's ever going to end. You think that constantly you're going to keep on moving forward, and there's never going to be... You know, you know, prep is never going to end, and it's going to be a great four years, and you're going to keep on having these great experiences, and you're going to learn from great teachers, and you're going to make great friendships. But sometimes time can be ripped away from you. All right? About two years ago, I was teaching at an inner city high school in San Antonio, Texas, on the west side of San Antonio. It's about as different an area as Fairfield County um, could be. And uh, it's in between first and second period. And I'm waiting for my, my sophomores to, to walk in. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, World War I. It's in May. Um, the school year is almost over. Everybody's kind of itching. And I get a phone call from uh, one of my best friends, a kid named Rob Majorano. 
And uh, he would call me every once in a while during school just to kind of like screw with me or send me a text message saying like, you know, I see you even though he lives in New York City, uh, which didn't make any sense. But, um, but, he, uh, but I pick up and I'm like, hey buddy, I can't talk. And he said, uh, no, you got to take this phone call. I said, all right, what's going on? He said, Hauser's dead. Now, Hauser was a kid named Zach Hauser who was one of uh, my best friends along with Mr. Ryan, along with our friend Rob. And uh, Zach was a uh, medical student out in California. He's also a type 1 diabetic. And one night, you know, he, uh, he has a diabetic seizure. He's unable to get to his insulin and he passes away. And so you're kind of sitting there and you're thinking to yourself, wow, you know, here's a kid who I, who I grew up with. Here's a kid who I knew all throughout middle school, who I played football with in high school, who I had class with, who, you know, we were on the same party bus at prom together, who we, you know, walked alongside each other at graduation, who every time we got together at, uh, for breaks, you know, we'd meet up and play basketball or go to the gym or simply sit around and talk about our prep experience, and now he's gone. You know, and it kind of puts things into perspective. You know, I think about how, how should I value my relationship with Zach? How should I push forward? And how should I uh, honor him? And so my friends and I, we started an email chain, okay? And we kind of figured out, the, the, you know, the seven or eight of us who were very close, we kind of figured out, hey, let's do something that will honor Zach moving forward. And now this email chain in those two years probably numbers in the thousands. I'm going to say, you know, 5,000. And it ranges from, you know, uh, hey, I got a job at prep, which is something that I sent last year because I was so excited. Actually, the one year anniversary of me getting the job at prep was yesterday. Um, you know, we, we, get, we get emails from friends saying, hey, I got engaged, which is something that none of you should know anything about right now. Um, you know, we'll, 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 we'll cross that bridge later on. Um, we talk, uh, we get emails with YouTube clips of, you know, dogs falling on ice or, you know, some guy falling down, things that we think are funny, you know, but at the same time, it's something that will last. Um, we started something called a, a Fearful Prep Mancation, not a vacation, a mancation, okay? Only dudes are allowed, all right? Last summer we went to Florida, uh, you know, we sat around a pool. Uh, we played some golf, we went to the beach, this summer we're going to Lake Tahoe, um, you know, and it's something that I look forward to each and every year because, you know, once you leave this place, you guys are all going to spread out. You know, I have friends who live in San Francisco, I have friends who live down in Florida, one of my best friends plays professional rugby in the Philippines. You know, we're all spread out, but at the same time, I know that if I call any one of them, they would pick up the phone and they would figure out that you know, hey, how, what can I do to support you? Another story that I was thinking about was a couple of years ago, my little brother graduated from prep. He graduated in 2011. And that year in 2011, one of his classmates, a kid named uh, Ryan Brennan, tragically passed away due to cancer. All right, there was a whole campaign that said, just beat it. You know, Ryan fought hard. He fought for a couple of years and unfortunately passed away right before his senior year. And I was sitting in a, in, at graduation, and Father Hanwell gave a speech, and he started calling up people to, um, uh, to, to get their diplomas. And they get to, they get to the beads, and they get to, they get to Ryan Brennan's name, and they always tell you at these things, don't, uh, don't applaud until everybody's gotten their diploma. Well, they call up Ryan Brennan. Uh, his dad comes up and accepts the diploma. And I'm, and I'm not lying, there might have been a five-minute long you know, standing ovation for this man. You know, you want to see brotherhood in its most basic form, you know, in a time of crisis, we band together, all right? When it comes to opportunity, the second thing that you can never get back in life, prep is a unique opportunity. Each and every day, you show up and you wear a shirt and tie, or at least you kind of do. Um, you know, Jack Kowaleski definitely doesn't. Um, <laughs> you know, it's, it's something that sets us apart, all right? is something that says that we are different than everybody else, all right? It is not a uniform, it is a dress code. It is something that sits there and tells me, hey, I'm proud of who I am, I, I'm proud of my school, and I'm gonna look good each and every day, all right? 
use this prep experience as an opportunity to push yourself. All right? Don't take any days off. Don't sit there and become complacent. Complacent is one of those things, uh, complacency, I should say, is one of those things that can kill a dream. All right? So if you have a university that you want to go to, keep working hard. If you have something, a sports thing that you want to make, take advantage of that opportunity. You know what? If you're a football player and you want to be in the play, go be in the play. If you're a, a basketball player and you want to be in the music, uh, you want to be in jazz band, go join jazz band. So, you know, if you want to join the football team or you want to join the rugby team or you want to be in mock trial, go and do those things because when you flip over every stone, when you turn over every stone, you find that your experience is a fulfilling one. You know, when I was at prep, I was able to do a lot of things. I did everything from student government to three sports, you name it. And if I could go back and do it over again, I'd do it the same exact way. All right? I think about how you take advantage of your own opportunities. All right? When I was, uh, when I was 24, I was in graduate school at Providence College, and I was trying to figure out where I wanted to teach. All right? And I had a job offer at a boarding school uh, on the Canadian border in Vermont. All right, really nice school, uh, great faculty, great student body. And I'm sitting in the interview, and I'm thinking about, you know, should I take this job? And in the middle of my interview, I get a call. And the call is from a principal at a school called Holy Cross down in San Antonio, Texas. And he says, hey, Mr. Wallace, we know we'd really like you to join our faculty. Um, I know you have experience having gone to Catholic school. I think you could be a real asset to our to our uh, school community. And so I'm sitting there and I'm thinking about it, and I drive back down to Providence. And at the time, I was living with a friend of mine from prep, and we were weighing the options. We were weighing pros and cons. And he told me, he goes, you have this opportunity to go off and see a new part of the country and to explore and to expand your experiences. You owe it to yourself to leave here and go down there. Now, the first day I was down in San Antonio, I'd never been to Texas before, all right? I show up, uh, I am a six foot five, incredibly socially awkward white guy, all right? Let's just call it what it is. I'm a fantastic dancer, but only I think I'm a fantastic dancer, okay? Um, I walk into a school that is about, on the low end, about 98% Hispanic, okay? I'm an outcast. I'm somebody who's different. They've never seen somebody like me before, all right? It takes a little while to get used to one another, all right? There's a, there's a feeling out kind of process. And right in the beginning of my, uh, my career there, in October, Hurricane Sandy hits. All right? And Hurricane Sandy, I grew up in Fairfield down by the beach, and my house floods. All right? And so I'm sitting there, and I'm freaking out. You know, my, my parents have to evacuate their house. Um, you know, my little brother's away at college. My little sister's away at college. Nobody's there to help my parents. I'm thinking about leaving, going back. All right? My dad says, stay. And what's crazy is that my kids actually raised money to send for the relief effort up in Connecticut. Here's somebody that they've known me for a month, and they want to send money to help other people. Two months later, we're sitting in school. It's a Friday afternoon uh, in December, all right? And one of my kids comes flying into, flying into school, and he sits there and says, hey, did you see what happened in Connecticut? And I said, no, what's going on? And he's the first kid, his name is Nico Jordan, he's the first kid to tell me about the Sandy Hook shooting. All right? And my heart starts to break. He goes, hey, is Newtown near you? I said, yeah, I know kids from Newtown. Kids who go to my high school uh, are from Newtown. And, you know, you're sitting there and you're thinking to yourself, you're asking to yourself, why am I here? And so, you know, we're talking about this whole shooting and we're talking about this time of tragedy. And one of my... Uh, one of my sophomore girls at the time was a girl named Jessica Bocanegra. And she said, hey, why don't we do something about this? Why don't we show your hometown, your home state, that we love them? And so I sat there and I said, how are you going to do that? And she goes, I'm going to write a letter. So she writes a letter. She gets one of her friends to write a letter. She gets another friend to write a letter. She gets another friend to write a letter. And before I know it, I have over a thousand letters. All right? I bring him to St. Rose of Lima uh, Catholic Church a couple weeks later. And what's incredible to see is how, when given the opportunity to go out and expand, how people will rally around you. Prep is that place.
where if you allow yourself to take advantage of the opportunity, people are going to rally around you. All right? The last thing I want to talk about is something called the spoken word. All right? And the spoken word is something that is, that is unique. In a lot of ways, you can't get the spoken word back. I could insult you. I could insult Christian. And I could say something really mean to him. And no matter how many times I apologize to him, I still said it. Okay? What I'm trying to get at for you guys is you're young, you're still learning who you are, you're still finding your passions. But when you converse with people, and when you talk to people, and when you build your relationships, mean what you say. If you read the prep today, um, I was fortunate enough to be able to write an article for it. And one of the things I hope you guys do in the long run is you put down your technology and you listen to people. All right? You listen to your classmates. You talk to them in the hallways. You talk to them in the cafeteria. You talk to them at practice. You talk to them in theater. You talk to them in music. You go on a Kairos and you get to know somebody. You go on an urban plunge. You go to Appalachia. You go to Ecuador. You go to El Salvador. You do all these different kinds of things that will push you outside your comfort zone and, get, and allow you to get to know somebody. I would say talk in class, but don't talk in Hellstern's class because uh, sometimes he yells and it scares me. Um, don't, don't do that. All right? In the long run, though, I'm not naive enough as a teacher to have you sit here and listen to me. And I know for a fact that, you know, if you're in one of my classes, if I'm lucky enough to have any of you as a student, I know that on a Tuesday you might not remember the ins and outs of the Roman Empire, or why World War II started, or um, how Reconstruction shaped the United States. You know, what makes prep a brotherhood, what makes prep prep, are the other relationships, all right? So what I encourage you to do tonight, and tomorrow, and for the rest of today, is just to listen, you know? Go, go off and talk to somebody who you may have never talked to before. It's something that is um, a unique uh, experience that you may never have uh, again. Actually, you're never going to have it again. This is your only freshman retreat. You know, I also think at times you should figure out what you're passionate about. Well, once you figure out what you're passionate about, you should use your, this prep brotherhood in order to support your dream and support your passion. Um, one of, uh, if you walk into my classroom, um, it's, it's kind of crazy at times, all right? I have an entire pole that's covered in bumper stickers. Uh, I have an entire back wall that we call the wall of motivation, all right? There's pictures of famous figures and quotes and, and you name it on it. But my favorite, my favorite story on that wall of motivation is a story called The Guru, okay? I'm going to share it with you real quick because I think it embodies what prep is all about. It's about supporting somebody. All right? And the way the guru goes, if you've never heard it before, is that there was a young man who wanted to make a lot of money. All right? And so he goes off to this guru who knows how to make money. And he, he asks the guru, hey, man, I want to be on the same level you're on. I want to, I want to make a lot of money. I want to be powerful. I want to uh, have everything that you have. And the guru says, all right, fine. Meet me at the beach tomorrow morning. And I'll teach you how you can make a lot of money. So the guy says, okay, fine. So the next morning, the man shows up really early in the morning, 6 a.m. He's wearing a nice suit. He gets to the beach. The guru isn't there. And he's sitting around. He's like, for real? I'm like, what the hell is this guy? All right? He sees out about 100 yards out of the, uh, out of the ocean. He, he sees a man sitting on the boat, and he recognizes the man as the guru. And the guy says, hey, why don't you come on in um, and take me out on the boat with you? And the guru says, no, walk out into the water. So the guy starts walking out into the water. Gets about knee deep. And the, guy, the guru asks him, hey, what do you want more than anything? And the guy says, I want to, I want to make a lot of money. And the guru says, walk a little bit further out. So the kid walks a little bit further out. He's about chest deep now. All right? The guru asks him again, what do you want? He says, I want to make a lot of money. The guru says, all right, no problem. Keep walking a little bit further out. Now he's neck deep. The guru asks him again, what do you want? The kid says, I want to make a lot of money. All right? The guru says, all right, come a little bit further out. 
now the water's at the kid's nose. He's treading water. He can't, you know, he can't, his feet can't touch the bottom anymore. And the guru sits there and says, what do you want more than anything? And the kid says, I want to make a lot of, and as he says money, the guru takes his head and shoves it under the water. And so the guy is sitting there and he's struggling for air and he can't breathe and he's trying to figure out how to survive. And just as, just as he's about to pass out, the guru lifts his head out of the water and says, what did you want to do more than anything? And the guy says, I wanted to breathe. And the guru says, when you want to succeed as bad as you want to breathe, then you'll be successful. And the reason why I share this story with you is that I think about prep. And I think about the things that I've been able to accomplish. I've had a lot of gurus that I've been able to, to learn from. Um, I think about my own prep experience, being able to be taught by guys like Father Barry, and Lou Sirocco, and Barry Wallace, no relation. Um, uh, Mr. Galligan, Carlton Galligan. I think about the teachers that are currently here and sitting in this room with you, guys like John Zabs, um, uh, Megan Hoover, uh, James Chesbro, uh, Lynn Chesbro. Uh, I think about um, guys like uh, Matt Sather and Rudy Moritz. And these people <coughs> have been put here in order to help you find success and find your passions. All right? My last thing that I want to talk about because I want you guys to go off and, and enjoy the rest of your retreat, is as an alumni of the school, I want to welcome you to the Brotherhood. All right? I'm excited because I put a brick in this wall that, that we're building right now. I put a brick in this wall in 2006. Thousands before me put a brick in the wall in the years since 1942. In the years since 2006, even more people put bricks in the wall. Now, you have you guys, you know, the class of 2018, being able to come in and put your own bricks. And guess what? All your bricks are unique. I'm looking forward to seeing what each one of you comes out as. All right? Now, with this idea of having a wall, a wall is strong. If one brick crumbles, the entire thing crumbles. So support one another. Love one another. I think oftentimes the word love is misused. All right? The prep alumni love you unconditionally. We would do anything for you. We'd, we'd, we'd work for you um, through thick and thin, all right? With the expectation of when somebody else needs help, that you're willing to do that, all right? The last thing, I'm gonna quote one of my favorite poets, a guy named Marshall Mathers, okay? okay? You might know him as Eminem, all right? Um, he has a song called Lose Yourself. All right, in the beginning of the song, he says, look, if you had one shot or one opportunity to see everything you ever wanted in one moment, are you going to capture it or let it slip? Yo. Um, so, <laughs> my palms are kind of sweaty. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> at the same time, if you think about it, what he's encouraging you to do is he's encouraging you to take each one of those uh, things that I told you not to lose, all right? He's taking the time to tell you not to waste your opportunities. And guess what? He wasn't putting any fluff in those lines. He knew exactly what he was putting into those bars, and he meant every word of it, all right? Moving forward, I wish you a great freshman year. I want the most for you. If you ever need anything, you know where to find me on B405. I'm, the, again, the socially awkward white guy with a large beard this time. Um, I love each and every one of you. God bless and enjoy your freshman retreat. Thank you.